Um, I'm Amy Ranger, and I'll be moderating the session. Um, some really quick housekeeping. Um, we have a live chat going as well as a QA. and a um, Feel free to chat if you have any um, tech issues or um, just want to say hello. Um, and then if you have questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A and we, um, our speakers will address all of them at the end. Um, I'm so very excited about this particular workshop. Um, we have specifically requested this one and I have particularly specifically requested moderating it because I think it's one of the most important content areas um, that we can bring to the field. Um, we know that if we at School Based Health Centers can build better and smarter, then we can um, offer more services and, and serve more young people. Um, this is one of the uh, most highly requested technical assistance topics that we get. So we're really excited to have our friends at CPCA join us today and really grateful to you all. Um, just to frame a little bit, there, this is a lot of detail. Um, luckily, the slides will be available, so don't feel like you have to take in all the nuances. Um, and the first half will be sort of some foundational overview, and then we'll build off of that for some practical tips in the second half. Um, so definitely feel free to put any and all questions in the Q&A because we'll come back to them. And also don't get too overwhelmed. Um, CPCA and CSHA are always here to help you after conference, so don't feel like you have to figure it all out today. Um, so a really, really big thank you um, to Andy Martinez-Patterson, to Emily Shipman, and to Bao Zhang um, from CPCA, as well as Tracy Mendez, our um, executive director, and I will pass it over. Great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. This is Emily Shipman. I'm going to kick us off, hopefully technology permitting. Thanks everyone for being here. And on behalf of the CPCA team, um, we're very happy to be joining you um, and to be talking about billing today. So here's us. You'll also see us live as we're presenting. Um, and as Amy mentioned, if there's anything that comes up after the session or questions you ask during the session that we don't get to, we're always available to you. We can absolutely talk offline um, after the session and, and make sure that people's questions are answered. All right, so our agenda for today, I'm going to talk first about establishing FQHC sites, um, and then we'll talk more about billing and look toward um, the future of Medi-Cal reimbursement. So first things first, establishing sites. Um, so we're gonna talk quickly about HRSA scope, um, site licensure and Medi-Cal enrollment, establishing PPS rates and adjustment of PPS rates, um, you may be wondering why we're starting a, a billing session talking about establishing sites, but the truth is um, how you establish your FQHC location has significant impact on how you can get paid later down the line and ultimately what services you can offer. Uh, so before we get into those billing specifics, I want to make sure that we share an understanding of the important steps that come first. Um, so adding that site to your Hersoscope, navigating the various licensing options for new sites, understanding how PPS rates are established and the implications of all of these things uh, for billing and delivering services at school-based sites. All righty, so HRSA scope. Um, let's talk first about HRSA scope. So HRSA, um, for folks in the room who, who aren't um, FQHC familiars yet, HRSA stands for the Health Resources and Services Administration, which is an arm of the US Department of Health and Human Services. Through its Bureau of Primary Health Care, or BIPIC, HRSA operates the health center program. Um, health centers deemed by HRSA are also referred to as federally qualified health centers, or FQHCs, and organizations must work with HRSA to establish and maintain their FQHC status. Once an organization is established as an FQHC by HRSA, um, any new sites being added within the organization must go through approval uh, to be included in the FQHC's HRSA scope of project. The HRSA scope of project defines the sites, services, and any additional locations or activities that are covered under the organization's FQHC status. And this is important because any activities and sites outside of the HRSA scope are not eligible for health center program benefits, um, including PPS reimbursement, uh, Federal Tort Claims Act or FTCA liability coverage, uh, and more. So the scope applies at the organization level um, so each site is represented in scope, and not all services within the scope will necessarily be available at each site. So when it comes to establishing a new FQHC site in California, Medi-Cal will look to verify that the site has been added to the HRSA scope 
And if it hasn't, Medi-Cal won't enroll the site um, as an FQHC, at least until this step is completed. And thank you to someone for already chatting in a question here. What is PPS? PPS refers to, I think it's prospective payment system, and it's the um, it's the enhanced reimbursement that FQHCs qualify um, for through Medicaid and Medicare. So it's a bundled payment instead of um, the traditional payment that Medi-Cal, other Medi-Cal provider types receive. So it's cost-based and it's, um, we'll talk a little bit more later about how the rates are set um, and how they're um, amended. So thanks for that question. Okay, um, one final note on HRSA scope is that often there's confusion between HRSA's definition of an intermittent site um, and the licensure exemption status in California for primary care clinics. That's also referred to as intermittent status. Um, so I see that come up a lot that there's confusion. When HRSA says intermittent, um, they're referring to a definition that's included in their policy information notice 2008-01. Um, and under this definition, a site that should be designated in the HRSA scope as intermittent rather than permanent is one that operates for up to two months at a location before moving to a different location or closing. Um, so one example might be services that are provided at a migrant camp. Um, in contrast, most of the time when we talk about intermittent sites in California, we're referring to a licensure distinction. Intermittent sites are operated by licensed sites, but are not licensed themselves. Um, and I'll talk a little more about licensure next. Okay, so site licensure and Medi-Cal enrollment. Nonprofit primary care clinics in California, so including all FQHCs, are required to be licensed or established as exempt from a licensure um, through the centralized applications branch of the California Department of Public Health's Licensing and Certification Division. So licensure requirements include um, meeting OSHPED 3 building standards. The standards are updated every three years, as well as requirements around fire authority approval, storage of medical records, infection control policies, et cetera. And the licensure process involves submitting an application to CDPH um, and waiting for them to approve before operating. And this step is the source of a lot of delays for FQHCs because oftentimes there is back and forth with the licensing analysts to complete an application, um, to move it through the on-site survey when that's required. And in general, CPCA, we advise health centers to plan for at least a few months um, for the licensing process and longer if there are significant changes being made. Um, some examples, maybe a, a change in ownership, a change in location. Um, and FQHCs also apply to the Medi-Cal program through the licensing process with CDPH. So the Medi-Cal certification documents are routed through CDPH and over to Medi-Cal for processing and enrollment. And that's the process for a licensed site. Um, there is an alternative licensure pathway for sites that don't operate more than 40 hours per week. Um, and this is known as intermittent status. Intermittent in this case means exempt from licensure. And if you're curious, you can read about the various other licensure exemptions um, in the Health and Safety Code under Section 1206. Uh, in the case of intermittent sites, they're operated by another licensed site, often referred to as a parent site, uh, within their organization. And they still need to meet fire and life safety requirements, but they're not required to go through the full licensing process. Um, and they're also not eligible for their own PPS rates. They will use the PPS rate of their parent site um, that is selected by the health center. So this is important to understand if your school-based site will be intermittent um, because it means that the intermittent site's Medi-Cal scope is tied to the parent site scope. Um, FQHCs must notify CDPH of their intermittent sites, but they're not required to get that same approval um, as a licensed site before they operate. Intermittents, though, do need to also separately enroll into Medi-Cal and notify Medi-Cal. Um, and this is done via informal memo to provider enrollment division. That's also the process through which the health center identifies which um, parent site they want to use the PPS rate of. So I know we already had one question around PPS. Let's talk a little bit more about it. So PPS rate establishment. Because intermittent sites don't establish their own PPS rates and they bill under a parent rate, um, this slide is specific to licensed sites. Once a site's gone through the licensing process with CDPH and they're on their way to Medi-Cal enrollment, 
um, because remember, they already submitted their Medi-Cal forms through CDPH. Then it's time to work on establishing the site's PPS rate. Each licensed site gets its own rate, and there are two ways to go about this. One is to do a rate based on costs, where an interim cost report is submitted to the Department of Healthcare Services uh, to establish this interim rate. Then the actual costs are submitted and audited later after the health center has been operating. Um, and this results in the final PPS rate. Or um, an FQHC can opt to do what's called the three comparable clinics process, where they select three existing FQHCs that they'd like their rate to be based on. If DHCS agrees that the sites, the three selected sites are similar enough, um, then the new PBS rate is, is calculated by averaging the rates of those three sites. Um, but we don't see that option utilized as much as the cost-based um, because there tends to be disagreement with the department over what constitutes um, similar or similar enough. And again, DHCS will look to ensure that the site is active and approved by HRSA before they um, approve any interim PPS rate as effective. However, understanding that the licensing process can sometimes hold up the rate setting, um, DHCS will make the PPS rate effective uh, retroactively to an earlier date, so long as you're able to get your rate setting package in, whether it's cost-based or three comparable clinics, within 90 days of your HRSA scope approval. So just like to make sure that folks are aware of how those deadlines kind of intersect um, to impact your effective date of your rate. And let's finally talk about adjustment of the PPS rate. So I want to make sure that we all understand how adjustments to the PPS rate impact the site. Every PPS rate is automatically adjusted annually to reflect the Medicare economic index uh, increase. It's typically a small amount. I think this year Val could probably correct me. I think it was about one and a half percent. Um, and this happens in the fall. Typically, we see Medi-Cal start making the adjustment around October. Um, this is automatic, and there's nothing that FQHC needs to do in order to see the increase. However, FQHCs also have the option to adjust their PPS rate throughout the year by filing what's called a change in scope of services request uh, or change in scope. And our California state plan amendment defines what we call the triggering events that allow for a scope change. And this involves documenting that there's been an increase um, or addition to the services being provided. So from there, the scope change is essentially redoing the cost report that was used to set the initial rate. So the FQHC documents their costs for an entire year and submits those to um, the Department of Healthcare Services as a change in scope. The auditors there audit that cost report and then they work with the health center to establish the new rate. Um, part of the change in scope process includes that final rate being reduced by 20% before becoming effective. Um, according to the department, this is to account for all of the costs that can be added into the cost report that don't necessarily correlate um, to the site whose rate is being adjusted. Uh, so this is their way of averaging those out. One way to avoid that 20% cut when changing your rate is to utilize a change in location process. When a health center site moves to a different location, they can re rebase their PPS uh, rate without that cut. So we see some health centers um, take advantage of that. Aside from the optional change in scope process, I want folks to be aware that there are some changes or additions that mandate a change in scope. Um, adding dental hygienists or licensed marriage and family therapists as billable providers does require, excuse me, require um, a scope change. So similarly, reducing services or making changes that, that result in an overall estimated decrease in the rate of more than 2.5%, um, based on the health center's own analysis, that also requires a change in scope. If you set a PPS rate inclusive of costs of an intermittent site, for example, and then later choose to separately license or otherwise remove that intermittent site, um, something like this would also trigger a required change in scope um, to adjust that parent rate. So one example of how this might play out in a school-based health center um, is included here on the slide. So let's say you're operating a school-based site that is intermittent, um, and you get the opportunity to bring on a dental hygienist once a week to do screenings or other services at your, at your school-based site. If the parent site doesn't already have dental hygienists in the PPS rate, this is gonna trigger a, a change in scope in order to bill for those dental hygienist services, even though they're happening at the intermittent location and not at the parent location. Um, because the dental hygienist is one of those provider types where the change in scope is required. Now, if you want to bring on the dental hygienist but not bill PPS for the services, 
then you can avoid the scope change requirement, but of course, then you're not getting PPS reimbursement for the services. Okay, um, I'm hoping that raised some considerations for you to think about in the context of billing and running school-based sites, and I don't know that we have time to take questions now, um, but we'll certainly um, hope to have some time at the end, and again, um, you can reach out to us via email after the session as well, and continue, if you're not already, um, submitting questions into the Q&A tab. Okay, um, Bao, I think you're up next. All right, great. Thank you, Emily. Hi, everyone. All right, so um, I think that Emily provided a really great um, framework for um, how to set up your site, um, how to establish your rate. And once you have all of that in place, um, you can start to bill for those services. So what I'm gonna go over in the next couple of minutes is billing for your Medi-Cal patients. Um, and my portion of the presentation is going to focus on, you know, defining what a billable visit is, um, looking at some of the limitations of the PPS um, payment methodology, um, which includes, you know, same day limitations, um, limitations on group visits, um, billing for out of network patients, and then I'll wrap up my portion of the presentation uh, by sharing a little bit about telehealth flexibilities and how to bill for those services. So um, I do want to start off by saying that FQHCs provide a full range of primary and preventative services, as well as dental, behavioral health, and vision services. Um, and FQHCs are unique in that they provide healthcare services to everybody who walks through their doors, um, regardless of the patient's income or insurance status. And this includes caring for approximately 4 million Medi-Cal patients. And as Emily mentioned earlier, um, FQHCs are reimbursed under the prospective payment system. Um, and it is a payment methodology that bundles the services and supplies that are provided during a visit into a per visit payment. Um, and this methodology is really designed to compensate an FQHC for all of the costs that it reasonably incurs um, during a visit with Medi-Cal patients. And so um, for that reason, the uh, billable visits are reimbursed at the FQHC's PPS rate, regardless of how sick the patient may be um, or how many services are rendered during that particular visit. And so um, what you see on this slide here is essentially the definition of a billable visit. And I think that it's really important to understand this definition because billable visits are at the core of PPS. Um, so it's important to know, you know, what's considered a billable visit so that you can get your PPS reimbursement for it. And Medi-Cal defines it as a face-to-face -face encounter between an eligible Medi-Cal beneficiary and a FQHC billable provider who is rendering medically necessary services. So it is a very restrictive definition in that sense. And what's included at the bottom of this slide here is the list of billable providers. Um, I won't read off the list. You can take a closer look at that um, because the slides will be made available to you. Um, but I wanted to share that that is the definition of a billable visit. Um, and just given the restrictive nature of PPS, um, it is important for FQHCs to understand that, um, you know, to understand the Medi-Cal billing guidelines for PPS reimbursement. And so I'll go over a couple of those in the next um, few slides. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about same day limitations because this applies to all FQHCs and essentially under the Medi-Cal um, definition of a billable visit, encounters with more than one healthcare professional and multiple encounters with the same healthcare professional that take place on the same day and at the same FQHC organization, even if it's at a different site within that same organization, constitutes a single visit. And so that's the same day limitation. There are two exceptions um, to this. One is, um, and those two exceptions are listed on the um, right-hand side of this slide here. So one is when a patient after the first visit suffers an illness or injury that requires another health diagnosis or treatment, 
So one example, an example of this is you have a patient who comes in, let's say in the morning for a behavioral health visit, goes home and in the afternoon trips and falls and sustains um, you know, an injury to the patient's ankle. And so the patient then has to come back for a second visit in the afternoon for the diagnosis and treatment of that sprained ankle. Um, because the injury that happened in the afternoon didn't exist at the time that the patient had their behavioral health visit in the morning, that makes it a separate billable visit. So in this instance, the health center can actually bill for both of those visits. The other exception is when the patient has a medical and a dental visit on the same day. Um, different state, uh, different um, Medicaid, um, different Medicaid systems throughout the state have different exceptions to this, but in the state of California, um, DHCS does allow for a patient to have a medical and a dental visit on the same day. And then I will just quickly note, um, it's like, it's small print at the end of this um, slide here, but CPCA um, and the California School-Based Health Alliance, along with other partners throughout the state, um, supported Senate Bill 316, which would have allowed uh, Medi-Cal to reimburse FQHCs and RHCs for a behavioral health visit that occurs on the same day as a medical or dental visit. Um, unfortunately, this bill was, um, it did not pass this year, um, but that doesn't mean, you know, we're not going to continue to advocate for it. It remains a high priority for CPCA, for our partners, for health centers, so we'll continue to advocate for this. Next slide, please. I also want to touch on group visits because this comes up a lot and I feel like it's been coming up more often in the last couple of years um, as health centers are, you know, starting to transition over to more um, integrated care. And so um, I've been getting a lot of questions around group visits. And what I'll share um, in, in this presentation here is that um, Medi-Cal has restrictions around group visits. So while DHCS has not released formal guidance on billing for group visits, it is our understanding in conversations with DHCS that Medi-Cal only allows FQHCs to bill for one a visit for the entire group visit. So for example, you may have a group visit in which there's 10 Medi-Cal patients participating in that group visit, but according to Medi-Cal's guidelines, um, the FQHC will only be able to bill for one patient that's participating in that group visit and not for all 10 patients. Um, it's also important to note that for your patients who are enrolled in a Medi-Cal managed care plan, even if the plan allows you to bill for each individual patient um, in that group visit, Medi-Cal stance is still that you can only bill for one wraparound claim for that entire group visit. Um, and I think over the years, I've gotten very detailed scenario-based questions from our health centers around like, what if we pull the patient out of the group visit to have a face-to-face -face encounter with a billable provider? Could we then at that point in time bill for each individual patient? Um, and while um, I try not to you know, give advice in terms of like the actual visits that health centers are doing and their workflows and um, all of that stuff, what I can generally say is that, um, you know, in the instance that you're, you're an FQHC that's doing group visits and each of the Medi-Cal patients that's participating in the group visit also has a face-to-face -face encounter with a billable provider who is rendering medically necessary services to that patient, um, the FQHC can bill for each of the qualifying visits. So what's important to note in that scenario is that, in the, at that point in time, you're actually billing for the face-to-face -face encounter with the billable provider. You're not actually billing for the group visit. Next slide, please. I also want to touch um, just a little bit on Medi-Cal managed care billing. Um, because we do get questions around whether or not FQHCs can um, see and provide, or see and um, bill for your out-of-network patients. So um, the answer is yes, FQHCs can bill for out-of-network patients. 
Um, but there is a process for doing that, which I'll walk through um, in a little bit. But first, I want to talk about how you bill for your assigned patient. So if you are a um, FQAT who's contracted with a Medi-Cal managed care plan, you know, and you have one of your assigned patients come in for a visit, um, the way in which you would bill is you would first bill your uh, managed care plan according to the plan's billing requirements, and then you would turn around and bill the state for your RAC claim. Um, so the process is pretty simple there. And then for your out-of-network patients, again, FQHCs can see out-of-network patients, but Medi-Cal does require that um, the FQHC remind the patient to see their assigned provider in the future and to document that referral in the patient's medical record. And in terms of billing, um, a similar process to billing for your assigned patients in that you bill the managed care plan first, and then you bill the state for your wrap. When you bill the state for your wrap, um, you are required to attach proof of payment or denial from the plan. And um, for most cases where you're billing a managed care plan for an out-of-network patient, you will get a denial. And so just make sure that you attach that denial to your wrap claim to the state. Next slide, please. I also want to touch on state telehealth flexibilities. Um, Medi-Cal was pretty restrictive when it came to telehealth services prior to COVID, um, and we're grateful for the telehealth flexibilities um, that have been granted during the public health emergency. So I just this is a um, timeline of um, both federal and state flexibilities that were granted throughout the past year and a half as you know we've all been um, dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. And I just want to um, quickly highlight two important dates. So one is May 13th of 2020. That is when CMS approved SPA 20-0024, allowing telehealth flexibilities for FQHCs and RHCs, um, which we'll go over some of those flexibilities in the next couple of slides. And then more recently, on July 27th of this year, Governor Newsom signed into law AB 133, which extends the current telehealth flexibilities until December 31st of 2022. Next slide, please. Um, I hope this slide here is not too intimidating. I'll walk through it with all of you today. Um, it is a overview of the telehealth um, services that were covered before COVID and then the flexibilities that were granted um, during the COVID-19 public health emergency. So let's start at the top row there. It says modality. And before the COVID-19 public health emergency, Medi-Cal covered synchronous telehealth and asynchronous telehealth. And during um, the public health emergency, expanded that um, to include telephone services, which is audio only um, visits. That second row eligible services, for the most part, um, Medi-Cal has not made changes to the list of eligible services for FQHCs when it comes to telehealth. Um, what I will note and is written in green here um, is that AMFT and ACSW services are billable during the COVID-19 public health emergency. And that was a flexibility that was granted under the SPA that I was talking about in the previous slide. The third row, billable provider requirement, um, no changes there. Medi-Cal has not expanded their list of billable providers. And so that remains the same. In terms of um, the requirement, there's three requirements in that, um, the last three rows here, the established patient requirement, face-to-face -face requirement, and the four walls requirement. Um, those were all limitations of telehealth um, for Medi-Cal prior to COVID and um, during the COVID-19 um, public health emergency, we did get state um, flexibility to go ahead and like waive those. So the established patient requirement is waived, the face-to-face -face requirement is waived, and the four walls requirement is waived. Next slide, please. All right, so now we, we talked about the telehealth um, flexibilities during the public health 
um, emergency. And, you know, questions that we've gotten is, okay, great. You know, we're very, very thankful for those flexibilities. Now, how do we implement that in the um, FQHC space and how do we bill for it as FQHC providers? So what you see here on the screen um, are, let's see. Okay, so what you see here on the screen is um, what's a covered service in terms of telehealth, which is on the right-hand side of the screen, and how do you bill for that? And then on the right hand, on the hand, right hand of the screen, it's your telephone visits, um, the kind of reimbursement that um, telephone visits are eligible for, um, and how you bill for them. So I'm going to direct your attention to the um, left-hand side of the screen first, and we're going to start at the top there with synchronous telehealth. Um, it is a live video conferencing between a patient and a provider. Um, and it is eligible for PPS reimbursement. And the way in which you would bill for this is you would bill um, Medi-Cal using the same process as you would for other billable visits where the uh, patient is in person. So um, Medi-Cal, at least up until this point, has not set up a different billing process or system for your synchronous telehealth visits. Um, with asynchronous telehealth, um, that is the transmission of medical data using store and forward technology. Um, and this too is eligible for PPS reimbursement. It's billed exactly like how you would bill for synchronous telehealth. And again, that's billing using the HIPAA compliant billing code sets that you would normally use for your in-person visits. Um, for telephone visits, um, which is outlined on the right-hand side of the screen, we're going to start at that top part right there where it says telephonic visits that meet all of the DHCS documentation criteria. So I want to note that for telephone visits, DHCS has very specific documentation criteria that FQHCs have to meet in order to bill for their PPS rate. Otherwise, it would be considered um, uh, it would be con considered a virtual communications visit, and it would not be eligible for PPS reimbursement. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so if I can direct your attention to the top you know right hand side of your screen um, for your telephonic visits that meet the dhcs documentation criteria you can bill um, for your pps rate and the way in which you would do that is you would bill using these existing hipaa compliant billing code sets and then you would include the appropriate corresponding cpt code um, that essentially tells DHCS whether it's a new patient or an established patient, and that corresponding CPT code is listed on the informational line. So it's not a separately um, billable service. And for your telephonic visits that do not meet all of the DHCS documentation criteria, um, this would be eligible for fee-for-service reimbursement. I believe the rate is around $24. And you would bill differently for this. So for these particular visits, you would bill Medi-Cal with HCPCS code G0071 on the payable claim line, and you would not include any corresponding CPT codes. Um, and that would tell DHCS that you're billing for a virtual communications visit, and um, then they can reimburse you at the fee-for-service rate of about $24. So what I don't have listed on this slide is the documentation criteria for telephonic visits. Um, I did include the link to the full DHCS guidance on telehealth and telephone visits at the bottom of the slide here. And so if you would like to take a closer look at that guidance, um, take a look at the documentation criteria, um, feel free to check out that link at the bottom of the slide here. Next slide, please. Um, so to just quickly wrap up the telehealth conversation, um, I always remind health centers that there's five main factors that determine how FQHCs bill for telehealth visits. Um, one is where your patient is physically located. So that's your originating site. 
And during the COVID-19 public health emergency, the four walls requirements um, was waived and it's actually waived until the end of 2022 because of AB 133. Um, the second um, factor is the characteristic of your distant site provider. So whether that distant site provider is another site under your FQHC organization, um, whether it's a, you know, another FQHC organization or if it's, you know, private fee-for-service provider, that does impact how you bill. Um, the third factor is if there's any kind of payment arrangement between the originating site provider and the distant site provider, and in the instance that there is some type of payment arrangement, there are restrictions around, you know, who can bill and how often you can bill. So if there is some kind of payment arrangement um, between you and another um, telehealth provider or another provider that's um, also seeing the patient during the telehealth visit, um, you would have to think carefully about, you know, who is supposed to bill in that scenario. The fourth factor is if there is a medical reason for a provider to be present with the patient. This is the face-to-face -face requirement that I had talked about earlier, and this is being waived until the end of 2022. And then the fifth and final factor is um, whether the patient is an established patient or a new patient. Um, prior to the COVID-19 public health emergency, telehealth services were restricted to established patients. Um, this is no longer the case um, thanks to AB 133. So the established patient requirement is being waived um, again until the end of 2022. Next slide, please. And finally, I want to talk about um, other flexibilities outside of um, the telehealth flexibilities. And I touched on this a little bit when I was going over that grid showing um, the telehealth flexibilities. So um, as I mentioned in that earlier slide, DHCS is temporarily adding AMFTs <clears throat> and ACSWs as um, billable visits um, that are eligible for PPS reimbursement during the COVID-19 public health emergency. Um, this became effective in March of last year and will be in effect until the end of the COVID-19 public health emergency. What's important to note is that um, while DHCS is adding these services as billable visits, they cannot be billed under the ACSW or the AMFT. Um, DHCS does require that um, a licensed practitioner supervise um, these um, professionals and that they assume professional liability for any of the services that are furnished by the ACSW or the um, AMFT practitioners. Um, and for that reason, services are billed under the supervising um, practitioner. And the way in which you would bill for those services is using the existing billing code sets for FQHC. So no new codes um, have been developed um, for use in billing for these services here. Um, so that wraps up my portion in terms of billing Medi-Cal. Um, and I will go ahead and hand it over to Tracy. Oh, interesting. Okay, so this version of the slide deck, hi everybody. Um, just a quick, let's see. I'm gonna switch. I thought this version had the minor consent Medi-Cal slides, but I don't see it. Do you want me to do, see if I can do a quick swap out? Yeah, that'd be great. Emily, if that's you. Thanks I'll just... for bearing with us for maybe just one minute. Yep, I'll just talk about it. So, um, hi everybody. Thanks so much, Emily and Bao, for um, all that great content. Um, I'm really just talking about one thing today, which is the Minor Consent Medi-Cal program. And the reason we want to include it in today's presentation is we think it's a really valuable and under misunderstood and underutilized program in California that offers a lot of um, services that as school-based health centers can provide to young people under their own consent. So um, I am certainly not an expertise on this program, um, but CSHA is trying to develop expertise because what we've learned is there's so little understanding of it across the state. Having said that, I see people on the in the meeting who have experience working with it. So um, hopefully if um, we can crowdsource some of the answers from, from that group. 
And um, what was the last thing I wanted to add about the program? Um, oh, just that in addition to trying to understand it here at CSHA, we're also trying to advocate to broaden the program. I'm going to talk about some of the restrictions uh, on the program currently. And we know that right now it's a really important time to offer more mental health services, especially to youth. So we think this program may provide the vehicle. And so that's something we're working on. Any luck, Emily? Yes, I am close. OK. All right. So I'm just going to start talking about the Minor Consent Medi-Cal program. It is a program specific to um, the state of California. And it allows young people, um, the age depends, so we'll talk about that in a minute, but to consent to sign up for Medi-Cal alone without a parent or guardian based only on their income and their assets or property. Um, and then they're consenting, or if they, if they become eligible, they will receive um, eligibility for a limited scope of services, and that scope will depend on how the application is completed. So the slide that Emily's going to share in a minute um, shows what those covered benefits are and the aid codes. I think you're all familiar with Medi-Cal aid codes. There are four aid codes specific to minor consent Medi-Cal, and they cover um, different services depending on what the uh, patient and the provider check off in the application. So Oh, I'm just going to listen because I think we're not live with slides yet. Oh, there we go. Great. So here are the services. And you'll see in brackets after some of the services, they say 12 and up. So for the services that don't have an age uh, limitation listed, listed, like family planning services, um, minors can be eligible for this program at any age, starting you know as young as, as whenever, eight or nine up to age 20. All these services go up to age 20 um, at the max. So some of them are must start at 12 and over, and some of them start at any age. Um, and can you switch to the next slide, please? OK, so now we're going to talk about the eligibility criteria for the program. Um, they're listed here. You can read through them. One thing I wanted to highlight is that undocumented youth can be covered. Um, and that minors who have family coverage, health insurance through Kaiser or some other private um, insurance, are eligible for this benefit. And that's one of the reasons we think it can be really relevant for health centers. Um, so uh, these same young people, your health center might be enrolling in the Family Pact program currently. And the same criteria uh, apply to minor consent in terms of their ability to get on the program, even if the family has commercial coverage. Um, I'll just mention here that in very rare instances, um, this coverage may come with a share of cost, which is like a deductible. Um, I've seen that only once in 30 years of working with the program, but I just wanted to mention that is a possibility. Um, next slide, please. So in addition to the criteria you saw in the previous slide, I want to mention that the way the program is currently established Minors can only qualify for outpatient mental health services if they meet this higher level of severity as described in the third and fourth bullets here. Um, and I want to note that this is a more stringent requirement than California law currently holds for minors to consent for their own mental health treatment. So to be clear, a minor, I think it's 12 and over, uh, can consent to mental health treatment from a mental health professional if they are mature enough to intelligently participate in treatment. That is the current bar in California. So many, many young people to cons consent to their own mental health services without a parent or guardian consenting. Quick sidebar is that doesn't mean the clinician won't involve the family. It just means they can start a therapeutic relationship without the parent consent. So that it allows a young person to uh, enter treatment. However, the minor consent Medi-Cal program has a much higher bar, and that is the minor must be in danger of causing serious physical or mental harm to themselves or someone else without receiving mental health treatment counselor, or they must be um, the alleged victim of incest or child abuse. So this definitely uh, narrows the um, population that can uh, receive mental health services through minor consent Medi-Cal. And the way that this, uh, this severity is demonstrated is the mental health professional 
uh, needs to write a letter, it can be a form letter that they fill out the clinical information, they need to submit that as part of the Medi minor consent Medi-Cal application. Um, and I'm going to give you a resource in a moment that has more detail about this, but we're trying to just give you some high level information about the program for now. Um, so next slide, please. So I want to very briefly um, walk through what the process is for applying for the Minor Consent Medi-Cal program, which is admittedly more complex than the Family Pact program, which many of you may be familiar with. Um, it's also a little bit easier than a family applying for full scope Medi-Cal services for their family. So the first step is that um, someone uh, needs to complete the M these two forms with the minor. So this can happen in a variety of uh, contexts. Um, in many of our um, strong school-based health centers, there is a social services eligibility technician who comes to the health center periodically, maybe once a week or even once a, once a month, and can help um, the uh, students fill out these forms. Um, they're you know, somewhat lengthy forms, and so often there are questions from the young people. Um, and so these forms are completed, and then they need to go with the, um, the te eligibility technician back to social services agency where they're processed. So you can see in the little side boxes that just like Bao described, during COVID, lots of new flexibilities have opened up for this process to happen through um, phone and email. Um, we don't know, I think, yet whether that will be continued, but that, there's advocacy for that as well. Um, and then uh, once the processing happens, most, most cases, the minor is eligible and um, a, this Medi-Cal card is issued with the ABE code and the date of eligibility. Um, if the application was completed today, November 3rd, um, usually the eligibility goes back to the first day of that month, so it would be November 1st in this case. Um, many school-based health centers actually have the workers bring the cards back to the clinic where they can give them to the students or even hold on to them in the clinic, and then they have the information they need to submit the claims. So um, this is one of the areas that is complicated. In general, this program is on um, eligibility is issued on a month-to-month -month basis, um, and a new form 4026 needs to be submitted each month that services are needed. Um, but there have been a number of variations from this practice um, across the state in different counties and in certain clinical conditions. Um, and it's another area for that we're hoping to do more advocacy in. Um, but generally after a full year, um, in whatever set of circumstances happens with the month-to-month -month eligibility, um, there's a new process that needs to, uh, a new form that needs to get submitted for ongoing eligibility. And uh, I want to mention that there's legislation pending in California which would allow eligibility for minor consent Medi-Cal to be redetermined electronically instead of in person even after the COVID pandemic ends. So next slide, please. Um, just want to highlight briefly why, you know, what the big takeaways are for us. Again, we think this is a great program for school-based health centers that are run by FQHCs specifically because they offer um, higher reimbursement, this PPS rate that Emily and Bao talked about, for the family planning services that most of you are providing through um, Family Pact now. I will briefly say as a caveat that um, one thing I've noticed in school-based health centers that do a lot of LARCs, um, long-acting re reversible contraceptives, when you um, bill for family planning services through the Family Pact program, you can actually bill a supply code for those LARCs. So might be an IUD or an Explanon, um, you can recoup your costs through that process. In the PPS rate setting process, those costs of supplies and um, any um, dispensed pharmaceuticals are included in the PPS rate. So you don't see that money come back when you submit a claim for a, a IUD insertion, for example. And that can be a little, um, you know, confusing or um, folks might think they're not doing as well under the program. So you have to do a full analysis of, of how the program would affect your revenue. Um, I just want to mention that. The other thing that's um, not necessarily as good about um, the Minor Consent Medi-Cal program compared to Family Pact is if you use a lot of non-licensed providers like health educators or navigators to provide education and counseling, those services are reimbursable under the Family Pact program at a pretty low rate, but there's a, a, an amount that can be billed. And as you saw from um, Bao's slides, 
um, those paraprofessionals are not billable providers under the Medi-Cal FQHC PPS rate. So if you're putting the young person on minor consent Medi-Cal and they spend an hour with a coach or a health educator, um, that would not be a, um, a Medi-Cal visit. Um, the other thing I want to reiterate is we think this program offers a great uh, potential option to um, provide mental health service for services for privately insured students who have high rates of, of mental health acuity. And again, doesn't mean the families can't ultimately involve, be involved, but it's a good way to start, open the door um, for kids that really need care. Um, last slide, please, of mine. Um, just wanted to offer a few recommendations um, for those that are interested in this program. One is if you haven't already, please talk to your local social services agency and see if there's a relationship you can established with your um, with the eligibility uh, staff. Um, a, one way to do this is through your local community clinic consortium, which all I think all counties in California have. Um, I'm going to, oh, it's on the slide. Um, we have a new um, behavioral health billing guide focused on FQHC run school based health centers. And there's more detail in that guide about diagnosis codes and procedure codes and how to utilize the program um, links to forms. And then we do think this is a slightly trickier to program to operate and sustain at school-based health centers. We find that um, it's really important to have internal staff expertise, both to know the program inside and out, and also set up like tracking mechanisms so you know when those monthly um, uh, forms are need to be resubmitted, maybe to keep the, the um, BIC cards on file, that kind of thing. That um, concludes my comments, and I would like to turn it over to the fabulous Andy Patterson Martinez, who is going to talk about the future of um, Medi-Cal reimbursement for FQHCs. Thanks, Tracy. I learned a lot about Medi-Cal consent. That's very interesting. Good to know. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about where Medi-Cal is going. I think everybody knows this, but I'm just going to say it on a high level because it is distinctly different and very clear from years past and school-based health centers are in an excellent position um, to expand and flourish under this administration and all of the leadership um, at Department of Healthcare Services. And I'm also going to talk about a new acronym, not PPS, but APM. It is an alternative to PPS, um, the alternative payment methodology, which I think um, has a lot of opportunity for school-based health centers to do even more and to flourish um, in their amazing model that they are today. Next slide. So this is a, a slide that I borrowed from um, Paula Bavaria, Dr. Paula Bavaria. She is our new chief medical officer at um, Department of Healthcare Services. And the Medi-Cal is starting to formulate for the first time a quality strategy, which will really dictate a lot of what you see and it will start weaving together all the programs at Medi-Cal so they all make sense together and we're all working as a team, a dream I think I've had, many of us have, have had for so long. Um, and I hope you see yourselves as school um, school health folks. You, you will see yourselves in so much of this. So the new direction for Medi-Cal, data is going to be it's always been important, so much more important now. If we're going to be connected and coordinated, it's really important that we're really good on collecting um, and reporting on our data. There's going to be a lot more um, transparency and accountability. This is really great for Medi-Cal beneficiaries. They can take more control of their health. Um, and it's very focused on eliminating health disparities, which is um, a mission I know that the School-Based Health Center, the School Health Alliance and CBCA hold true. Um, the goals are for the individual's patients to control their health care, finally. Um, this is excellent. It's all about prevention and families and community. Early intervention, which is where kids will come out loud and clear, and whole person care. So really wrapping care around the entire individual. Next slide. This is a, I, I won't read this to you, but this is a really great article. Um, you'll see the link at the bottom if you open up the slides um, about the why this is so important um, and how it ties to quality, how it ties to care coordination. It's aligned with why Me Medi-Cal Managed Care is doing a, pro a reprocurement of managed care plans, holding them to higher expectations. And so much of this is about all of our individual silos, all the individual offices needing to coordinate, because if we don't, it has people's lives on the line. Um, so just uh, encourage you to read that article. Next slide. 
So here is this again, I borrowed this from Dr. Bavaria. Children's preventive, this is the clinical focus. This is where Medi-Cal is going. So much of what we have been doing in years past has been on the, the high cost utilizers, which are very important too, but where this administration is really going is let's let's try to avoid having high cost utilizers. Let's really invest in children and in youth and in mamas and in behavioral health so that we can keep people healthy for the continuum of their life, not just when they get really sick, which is awesome. Um, so children's preventive care, behavioral health integration, maternity outcomes and birth equity, and I see school health centers uh, very central to this strategy. Next slide. I made this slide up. I just wanted a visual um, to help folks see this. They've DHS has seen this. They said it was okay for me to use, but I just wanted to show folks where all how all the initiatives start to play together. And I did not even include a lot of what Lisa Eisenberg talked about yesterday in her policy session, which was excellent. Um, but this is really to show you so community supports. Um, it was referred to as in lieu of services. These are things like provide that family with an air conditioner right? So they don't get um, overheated or asthma attacks and they end up in the ER. Let's do mold remediation. That's the type of social determinants of health is what I read in community supports. Um, and more and more providers and CBOs are going to be uh, receiving resources from managed care plans to support patients where they really need it. So they avoid the health outcome if they don't receive that service. Integrated behavioral health is going to be throughout the entire system for high cost utilizers all the way down to kids. $4 billion investment. Uh, Lisa was talking about that so much of it related to behavioral health. Enhanced care management is for the high cost utilizers. It's really those folks who need uh, a lot of extra support, um, a lot of case management, extra resources being given to providers and to plans to care for these folks. And then population health for everybody. So we are going to be taking a much more data um, a data-focused approach to caring for the totality of the Medi-Cal population. Next slide. I won't say anything, I just talked about these, but if you wanted a little bit more on ECM and in lieu of services, next slide. So this is just to, so when I see everything that Medi-Cal is doing, I see as, and I know that I'm biased because I work for community health centers, I advocate for community health centers, I see community health centers as central and paramount to all of that which Medi-Cal is seeking to achieve. And I've said this in front of the DHCS team and they they smile and nod, they agree. Health centers, and I would say school-based health centers, uh, principally and as a part of the school of the health center um, continuum are instrumental to making sure that this vision actualizes and is successful. Next slide. So this is a slide, lots of words on it, but what I hope you see in it is the, in the middle column, is payment modernization, which is uh, what we're trying to, we're trying to modernize the PPS system in FQHCs, which we refer to as the alternative payment methodology. And you will note that it is sandwiched between the CalAIM vision and principles and the vision and principles for managed care health plans and what they are aligned to. So you will see that DHCS has set out principles, the APM has principles and managed care plan also have principles and they're all aligned. And to me, this is a beautiful slide because it shows us all working together towards the same goals um, and really an exciting opportunity. So I'm gonna say a little bit more now about the details of what is the APM because this opportunity is coming. Next slide. So the APM is about all the bubbles around this um, fun flower looking object. So we're trying to do an alternative payment methodology within FQHC. So Bao and Emily did a wonderful detailed presentation on the intricacies of PPS. But at the core, simply PPS is a fee-for-service payment. It is a bundled fee-for-service payment for the array of supports that FQHCs provide in a visit. Um, but it requires and necessitates a Medi-Cal beneficiary to show up physically, for the most part, be seen by a provider, a billable provider to receive PPS. We are trying to move away from this, the construct of a volume orientation to more of a population health global perspective where we the goal is to keep the patient healthy and well, not to be benefited when they are sick. So we are flipping it into an APM, which effectively is taking PPS, that payment, and moving it to a monthly capitation payment, which is equal to 
what you would receive in PPS, but comes with one cash flow. Like, so you're just getting your money regularly upfront all the time, even if people don't come in. Um, but it allows you a whole bunch more flexibility. So it, it makes it much more easy if you know you're getting, I'm going to make it up $50 per member per month. You can, it doesn't matter about necessarily the billable visits that you're having. Now it's about the whole care team and what that patient needs um, individually. So you can do a lot more integrated behavioral health. You can use and improve, you can use different types of providers, ancillary providers, you know, promotoras, nurses, a whole array of new care team members, which ideally is promoting satisfaction and more balance for the providers in the health centers. We're hoping to reduce disparities. We're hoping to reduce cost to the entire system with this model. We're hoping to use different types of care that the patient maybe doesn't even have to come in. We can start emailing our doctors in this environment um, and the health centers are incentivized towards that direction. And it is very, very, very quality oriented. And we've been working intimately with Department of Healthcare Service to make sure that where their vision on quality is going, the APM is going. So we're aligned and working together. Next slide. So I've mentioned this effectively. What is the APM? It takes the PPS rate, converts it to a per member per month capitation. You, you get it no matter what for all your members, even if they don't come in. The incentive in this model is for your, your uh, assigned patients to be well um, and to do what you can to keep them well without having to be in these strict regimens of billable providers. Um, health centers that participate in the APM, which I will just put the timeline out there, the application for the APM right now is slotted for January, February 22. Health centers will then be selected come around April 22, and then the new rates will start January 23. Health centers in the APM will receive this capitation, and then they'll also be expected to report data, as I mentioned before, encounter data to the plans. They'll also be tracking alternative care. So in our environment, that would be a nurse visit a home visit, things like that. Um, and they would also be reporting on quality measures. Next slide. I'm not gonna talk through these in case you're like, what are those measures? There's gonna be a select number and they're gonna be aligned with managed care plans and where DHS is going with their quality strategy. Here is, we're working on all of these. We're still finalizing it, but this will give you a sense of where we're going. And you'll note a strong focus on PEDS. Next slide. Um, here are the types of things that health centers will be incentivized to be capturing via CPT codes, health coaches, health education, nutrition education. All of a sudden, these types of what we know really matters, but it doesn't count in our PPS environment, will count in the new environment. So health centers are incentivized in that direction. Next slide. So here's just a timeline. If you're interested, we've been building, we've actually been having conversations for 10 years. We talk about that at another time, but we're finally there um, and we are looking good to go um, for a state plan amendment submission this year. Um, application starting next year, as I noted, and then the program would officially launch as an opportunity year over year, starting in January 23. Next slide. Here is, if for those of you who are on this call who are affiliated with an FQHC, I encourage you to look at this slide at a later point to see if your health center has said, yes, I'm very interested in participating in this model because the APM will have a lot of impact for you. Next slide. So all of this to say is that Medi-Cal is really starting to focus so much more on kids, holistic care, integration, and coordination. This is a perfect prime moment. I know that the, the School Health Alliance already knows this, but it is an opportunity um, for some really great stuff to happen in California. Prime opportunity. Next slide. So how does the APM impact school health clinics? Um, so if you, so for the most part, and as Emily noted, school health centers tend to be an intermittent site affiliated with a parent site at an FQHC. So in the APM, and if, if an FQHC enters the APM and the parent site that has an intermittent school-based site participates, that school-based health center is now part of the APM. And I know that for the most, so health centers in the APM get paid for a panel of patients, whomever is assigned to them. School clinics tend to not have a panel of assigned 
patients. Um, it tends to be, you know, walk-ins, unassigned, but they're still getting paid PPS for those visits. In the APM, we found a way um, to create a capitation for those unassigned that will be paid uh, to the FQHC. So the school health center gets the advantage of all of the flexibilities that are coming to the FQHC parent location. School health centers also get to take advantage of that flexible type of providers, flexible type of care, all that goes along with it, which is really excellent. Next slide. So it's the opportunity of the non-billable providers, the flexibility in the care, and to keep being paid even if you aren't delivering those billable providers. This is a big one. So when COVID hit, for most of you, I'm sure this impacted you, your revenues immediately dropped because you didn't have people coming in. Huge problem in the next pandemic. So this is actually why the impetus of the APM was COVID. We realized we can't do this. We need to have a stable foundation for primary care clinics, FQHCs. So we need to have the consistency and the regularity of the payment. So school health centers will still receive payment even if they didn't have that billable visit. Next slide. So in case you're saying, this sounds awesome, I'd like to know more, I think you should be inquiring with your um, health center and health center leadership about what they're thinking about with the APM. Um, knowing more about whether your school health center is in fact an intermittent site, does it have assigned lives, what's the impact there? Um, it would be great to look at the measures that we have on that measure list and pull the data just to see how your health center is doing in relationship to those who are seen, if you're able to do that. Um, and maybe seeing the opportunities that if your school health clinic or the FQHC in writ large was starting to focus more on those measures, how it would impact your school health center, opportunities, you know, maybe challenges, but definitely a good thing to be looking at. Um, and then just looking at what other uh, uh, programs that touch kids impact your clinic. Next slide. I think I'm getting close. And then that's it. I am close. So hopefully that wasn't too much and it perked um, questions and excitement because we're pretty excited about the opportunities that come from the APM and all the, all the places that Medi-Cal is going. So I will stop there. Amy, Tracy, team, Emily, Bao. Yeah, great. Um, let's go to Q&A. We do have a couple questions to address. And then I know that there has been some activity in the chat. If someone could help me with figuring out if there's anything unanswered in the chat while we go through Q&A, that would be great. So let's start with Q&A. Um, how does adding a dental hygienist to the scope change the PPS rate? Will this adjustment lower the PPS rate? Um, the answer is maybe. There's a lot of different factors that go into calculating the rate. So when you file the change in scope, you're essentially updating the state with your current costs um, and visits. And so they're going to look at those and they're going to divide your costs by the visits and that'll be your rate. However, there's going to the gray area comes uh, comes in when there's the back and forth. Um, with audits and investigations over what costs they're going to allow, whether certain costs are going to be capped. Um, and then, of course, ultimately, you're getting that 20% cut off the top of the rate. But theoretically, if your rate hasn't been updated recently, um, your costs will have gone up. So what happens a lot of times is that health centers work with consultants or, or other um, financial analysts to sort of run the numbers before and, and make sure that there's a wide enough margin there that the rate isn't going to decrease because there is the chance that the rate um, could ultimately go down. So thank you, um, Paula, for asking that. And then there was another question. If a patient comes in for a dental cleaning, Bao, I think this one will be for you, um, and then goes home and cracks their tooth eating a walnut, if that patient then needs to come back for an emergency dental visit in the same day, would the emergency dental visit be an exception to the same day limitation? Yeah, so good question. Um, based on what I know about the that particular exception, I would say yes, but you want to make sure that um, you document well in the patient's record about the fact that it is an emergency visit um, and the scenario around why the patient came back later in the day for that second visit. Um, and then I do just want to note for the group that their um, DHCS have released updated guidance for dental, I want to say maybe about two years ago. 
Um, so keep in mind that for dental, in addition to following the Medi-Cal billing guidance, um, FQHCs do also have to comply with Section 5 of the Dental Cal Manual. Um, so that talks about, you know, covered services, utilization management, um, that sort of stuff. So you want to make sure that if you're providing dental services, you're following the Medi-Cal billing guidance, and then you're also um, complying with Section 5 of the Dental Cal Manual. Great. Thanks, Val. Andy, um, if a health center site's approved for the APM, does this replace PPS for that FQHC? Yes, I mean, I suppose the word is interesting. It converts their PPS rate to a capitation payment. So yes, they are moving, and, and I should also note, the APM is by site. So organize, a whole, and if a health center has 10 sites um, and more intermittents, but 10 parent sites, and they put in for all 10, then the organization is effectively all in and the entire, all the parent sites and all the intermittent sites will have their P individual PPS rates converted to this PPS equivalent capitation payment and then be, um, have the opportunity of all the flexibility I talked about. Great, thank you. And I know we have um, a bit of a lag, so we may not be caught up to questions that folks will have in the future, but Amy or Tracy, are you seeing anything else in chat that we can address before we wrap up today? Um, there were some great questions that I think that Tracy was mostly able to answer, as well as one more um, minor consent question that I don't think we have the answer to, but we'll hopefully be able to um, find out and put on our website. Um, but there's lots of great um, agreement that CPCA rocks. <laughs> and that, that came up in the chat a few different times. Um, so I'm just scrolling through and I think everything was answered, which is great timing because it's 11.59. Um, and so I'll just say, this is Tracy, I'll just say that I posted the two resources that I mentioned in the in the chat. If folks want to download them, one is um, the official Medi-Cal publication on minor consent Medi-Cal, which is actually fairly short, and the other is our new CSHA's new resource guide on um, behavioral health billing and sustainability. So I'll just say a really, really big thank you to our friends and colleagues at CPCA. This was incredibly informative and helpful. And um, I know people probably still have lots more questions. So definitely check out the slides and reach out um, to CSHA, probably reach out to us directly with questions. And then if there's more questions for CPCA, we can bundle them and, and see if we can get someone over there to answer them for you. Um, so thank you again to all of you. and. Um, Please fill out your evaluation for today and we'll see you at the next brain break as well as the last workshop for today.